Welcome everyone back to creating our first game in Godot. So today we'll be working on the player, creating a player, creating its scene, all of those things. So let's create a player scene and one of the benefits of actually creating a player's own scene is the fact that we can actually test it out before we create anything else. So we can test out the player before we even work on anything else, which is really nice. So first off, we'll need to actually create a rude node for the player object. So let's create a node. So here you can say area 2D because yeah. And we can just create that and there we go, we have an area 2D node. So with area 2D, the benefit is we can detect objects that overlap or run into the player. So the collision, it gives us collision detection. So let's actually change this to player. So before we actually add anything to the player, we first want to make sure that we just click here where it says make sure the object's children are not selectable. Because we don't want to accidentally move the, the player's children while we're working on something else. So just click on the node right here, the player node. And we can add a child node. We can call this an animated sprite. This will allow us to animate sprites. So sprites are basically, let me show you if I had a, I just wish I had something open here. So as you can see here, these assets, like here the art, here are the sprites. So this enemy flying, that is a sprite. It's just an image. But we call them sprites because they're small images that will basically be put together to kind of create an animation. You'll notice that this actually has a little warning next to it. It's because, as it says, a sprite frames resource must create or set the frames property in order to animate. So you just click on it and go here to the filter and just say frames. And right here, we can say new sprite frames. And I'll just click on it again. It will actually open the sprite frames panel, which is where we can manage all of the animations and stuff like that. So here is basically the list of animations, which we currently don't have. So we can just rename this to walk. Because this will be the walking animation for the player. We can also create a new animation by clicking on this button right here. And we can call it up. So this will be the up animation for the player. So here in this tab, file system tab right here, we can go to dodge assets and to art. And here we have a bunch of player things. So here in up, we can just drag and drop these in here. And here with walk, we can just drag and drop these in here. As you can see, here are the two animations for walk and here are the two animations for up. Now, if we go here, we can actually see that, if we can just scroll down, that the player is actually a little bit big. So we actually just want to scale it a bit. So I'm going to click on this. And here we can just search for scale here under node true 2d transform and we can just set it to 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 as you can see the player is much smaller now and i believe that is just much better as well now problem is we don't really have a collision detection actually built in just yet because this is just animation so we actually have to add collision so let's add to the player a collision shape 2D. There, collision shape 2D. And this is basically the player's hitbox. So when someone touches it, or when something touches the player, this will trigger something and we can then use that trigger into our advantage, which we'll get to way later on. So for this collision detection shape, we actually want to use the capsule shape 2D because I believe it just works a lot better. So we can just resize this to fit around the player. Oops, let me do this. And yeah, there we go. Basically, if anything touches the player within this blue circle right here, then it will trigger an event and we can use that event to be like, hey, something touched you. 
So just make sure your player scene does look like this, so it looks relatively the same, because then we have our basic player. So let's save this, and we can just call it player, as it sees there. There you can see there we have a player scene. So let's actually add a script to the player, so just click on the player and then click on the script right there. And we can keep everything else as default here, nothing really needs to change, we can just say create. And now we have a basic script. We can remove all of these for now because we don't need them. And we can create a few things. So we can create an export var speed and we can make that 400. And this will basically be how fast the player moves per pixel per second. So 400 pixels a second. So, And then we can create a variable and call it screen size. And this will just be the size of the game window. So game window size. So this export keyword here allows us to actually set this value in the inspector, so in here. So that's why that can be very useful. So we don't have to come here and change it there every time. We're actually adding another property to the X to the inspector. And you don't want to do this with everything. But you want to do it with the things you might be changing constantly around to see how it changes and things like that. So there you see it, let's save this. We can click on the player. And now you actually see script variables has a speed value. We can change this. So let's say 500 if we wanted to. So this is a nice way to modify it if you ever need to just change it slowly. Take note that this change won't take place inside of the script file. So you won't just see it there but it will be still be applied. So let's go back to the script. We can create a function called ready. And basically the ready function is called when a node enters the scene tree, which is basically a good time to find the window size as well. If you didn't really understand what I just said, don't worry. We will we'll see what it does in a second. Basically just when this is ready to actually show on the screen, this will be called. So when it's ready, and you can just say get viewport rect dot size, and it will just get the window size. So now we can start working on the process function. The process function basically gets called every frame. So every frame, something gets done inside of the process. And we'll have to do a few things. So we'll have to check for user input every frame. So if they press up or W, what will it do? We'll have to move in a given direction. So depending on what the player chooses for their input. And we have to play the uh, animation for that frame. So if they move up, we have to use the move up animation. If you go here to project and project settings, and you go search for input map, my bad, actually input map is right there. Never mind. Then here you can actually see the different types of inputs. So here where it says the UI right, I'm going to add my own custom ones. So here we can just say move right. Say add. And now there's a move right one. We can add one here, so it's a key. And now we just have to press a key. I want to make this D. Because by default you actually use the arrow key, so up, right, down. We don't, I don't want to use that, so I'm going to use the D, S, A, and W. But you can use that as well, you can even use them up later. And then we can just add our own ones. W, you don't have to do this, I just want to do it, because then I can also show you how to do it if you ever want to change it later on. And then move down. Add and here we can add an S. You can add multiple buttons to it as well. So here where it says UI down, we could have actually just modified this, but I like to do this because I find it just a little bit easier. So here with D, we could have like added an arrow key as well. And so now we don't have to create multiple if statements because now we just have one value that references to two things. And you'll see what I mean in a second. Okay, and that's where I'm going to leave it for right now. You just say close and get started. 
then create a function called underscore process, call it delta. So delta is just a given variable that will, that's basically the time pass between the last frame and this frame. We can create a variable velocity, which is a vector 2D, if you don't know what I'm talking about, or vector 2, you don't have to worry. Because this is just the player's movement, so their, I believe their direction. So, direction. Or just their move, because it would be something like this. Their X position and their Y position. Then here we can say, if input dot is action and that's why I'm not getting autocomplete, my input is probably wrong. Their input dot is action pressed. And this is if something is pressed, and here it already throws things up for us. So let's start with right. And in here we can just say velocity dot x plus equals one. Basically, if the player presses right or tries to move right, this velocity is x value. So x remember like x is this so it goes from left to right their x value will change so x will let's say x is 1 now while they press it every frame x will actually add 1 so it will add 1 to that every frame so there's 60 frames per second they will move 60 pixels so this right here just changes the X position of the player. So if they want to move right, then this will allow them to go like that. Because remember, X is like that, it's from left to right. And it, X basically starts, let's say here. So if they move one by X, it will go like that. Anyways, now you can use an else if here, and you can add more. But the way, the reason I don't like this is because let's say you're using WASD. If you press W and let's say D at the same time, you can only move in one of those directions. You can't move in both. I usually didn't ever like this when it's, whoops, my bad. I didn't usually like this if it's in games because I want to move diagonally. So when games do an if else statement with their input, I always get frustrated because I want to, I don't just want to move straight or just left. But if you do have like a game like that, then you can use instead of if and then another if, you can use if else. But anyways, let's continue. And actually just copy this because it's going to be a lot of typing if we're not going to. And here instead of move right, we can say move left. And move left will basically be the same, but it will be minus one. Here we can say move up. And this instead of X, it will be Y because Y goes up and down. So then that will be add, that will add. Actually, I think that will subtract one, not add one because X and Y starts here. So this will be 0x, 0y. Going downwards will increase y and going upwards will decrease y. Same with x. Going right will increase x, going left will decrease x. Anyways, and then move down. And we can make this y plus equal 1. If you don't know what I mean by plus equal 1, it's just the same as saying the, the, I'm just going to call that x for now, is equal to x plus 1. That's all I'm saying. If you don't know any programming, I do recommend you follow my Python course or my Lua tutorial, and then come back. But it doesn't really matter if you don't, because we will still be covering a lot of these. Then you can say if velocity dot length is more than 0, then velocity is equal to velocity dot normalized times speed, which I'm going to explain in a second because this is quite important. Then you can go here and say dollar animated sprite, and you can say dot play, and this will play the sprite. And in here we can just say else dollar animated sprite, and you can say dot stop, and this will make sure that the sprite stops playing. So if you don't move anymore, the spot will stop. So yeah, let's, let's go over it. So here we set the velocity and by default it is zero, zero. So we wouldn't have to set that because by default that is zero, but you can set it if you want. 
Because by default the player shouldn't just be moving unless that is part of your game where the player is moving unless the player says stop or something like that. Then every frame we check for the input and we add or subtract if they did press a button. So for example if you pressed move right then your velocity would basically look like this. So remember this is x and then y. So then it will go 1, 0. And it will increase this value each frame. And let's say we wanted to do y instead. Then it will be 0 and 1 each frame. So it will increase this one each frame. If you press two buttons at once, so let's say you, move, you press move right and move up at the same time, then you'll get something like this. So move right, that will increase to 1. And move up, that will actually decrease by 1. Let's go to rather move down, just so it's easier. And this, these will increase as you press the buttons. It sounds a bit confusing, but basically I'll link a video in the description where this gets explained so perfectly. So if you do, or if you are, or if you are having trouble understanding this, then I do recommend you go watch that video because it does explain it really well. Okay, basically, if we press this button right here, so move right and move down at the same time, the player would move faster diagonally, so like that. Then what if we move moving horizontally or vertically? This is because we're adding two numbers at once. So we can use velocity dot normalize to actually normalize that speed here. So they won't move two times the speed when they move like this, then what if they moved up and down? This dollar sign here is basically a shorthand for saying get node. So if you don't want to say get node and then put in whatever you want here, so in this case animated sprite, then you can say dot play. Then you can use this dollar symbol right there. So we can do this and it will still work perfectly the same. So we're going to maybe add a comment here. Dollar is equal to short and for get node. Underneath this house, we actually want to add one more thing. So we can go position is plus equal velocity times delta. This will just basically make sure the player doesn't move faster on different screens or on different frame rates. And then we can say position dot x is equal to clamp position dot x zero and then screen size of x. Basically here we're just saying okay the player is not allowed to go past the width of the screen. So yeah, they have to stay inside the screen. That's what we're basically saying here. We can do the same with y. So basically the player is not allowed to leave the screen and this is perfect. So let's play the scene just to make sure we can actually move the player around. So you can either click here or just press F6. So right there, F6 or just click there. And it will play this specific scene. So let's try and move the player. As you can see, we can move the player. But it, they cannot move away from the screen. And since we put the input right here, since we allow that to be the different uh, keys, so up, down, left, right, as well as W, A, S, D. We can use both if you wanted to. So that's nice. And take note, we don't move faster diagonally, which is great. And so let's test a few things out, just so we can see how it works. So let's remove this normalized, go like that. And let's run this, so if, I meant to say F6. And let's see what happens. Oops, I forgot to actually uh, go here and say velocity times equal speed. So basically we just removed this right there. Anyways, we try and run it now. So look how fast we move if we move from left to right. But if we move both ways, then we move faster. We don't want that. So that is why we have this right here, to make sure that doesn't happen. And this right here is just to make sure the velocity stays the same, or the, the movement amount stays the same over screen. So let's remove it. I don't know how much FPS I have, but 
we could see if it moves a bit faster or slower. And actually, I should have just gone here without delta. And now if you run it, let's see how fast I move. Because I'm getting a super high FPS, I'm actually just moving really fast. So this is where delta comes in really handy. So we just say times delta. And this will make sure everyone moves the same amount, the same speed, no matter what their frame rate is. So if we run this again, just to show you, then you actually see the, the animation doesn't really change. The animation stays the same no matter where you go. And if you could remember, we actually had multiple animations. So look at that eye, for example. Now if we were just to go back to the animation, click on player, right, animation sprite, and we just show that again. Then as you can see here, if we go to walk, it actually has an eyeball that moves, but we only see this. So we have to actually set the animation to tell it what animation to follow. So let's go back to the script. So let's go here and at the end of this function right here, can we close this? So after this, we can say if velocity dot x is not equal to zero, then dollar animation sprite dot animation is equal to walk. As we just set the animation to walk. So the velocity is at x not zero, that means they're moving in the x velocity, so left to right right to left so we want it to be the walk animation and then here we can also go in an else else if velocity at y is not equal to zero then it will be the same thing so you just copy this paste it and here instead of walk it will be up let's quickly see what happens we play this scene. Okay, so now we can do that, as you can see. And we can also move up and down. But the thing is, if we move left and right, the eyes keeps looking at one direction. We don't want that. We want to flip that. And here, as you can see, the eye also just keeps looking up. It doesn't actually look into the direction we want it to. So instead of actually just drawing more more uh, sprites like this, instead of just making more of them, we can just keep these two and we can just modify them to look inside of the game. So here when they walk, we want to set dollar animated sprite dot flip v, which means flip vertically, so horizontal, vertical. So we don't want it to flip up and down, we don't want that. So we don't want it to go upside down. And we can set this to false. So it means it won't flip upside down. And here we can say dollar animated sprite dot flip horizontally. And you can make that equal to velocity dot x is less than zero. Basically, if the x velocity is less than zero, meaning they're moving in this way because the velocity is becoming less, then this will flip horizontally. We can do the same here and say dollar animated sprite dot flip and we can just say that should be flip flip vertically is equal to velocity dot y is more than zero because remember if you're going down then the velocity would be more than more, more than zero because y increases if you're going up y decreases so let's run this and see if we get a better output. Awesome. So the game is already a completely different game. The only difference that we actually did was we flipped this picture. That's what we did here. We just said flip it. So we took that sprite and we flipped it to wherever we wanted to. So that is really nice. So take note, if you're having animation problems, just make sure that this is correct. So if you click your animated sprite, then as you can see, there's up and walk. These two don't have capital letters or anything like that, so it should be the same in the code.
Now, if you're sure that everything is correct and you're not having any problems, but if you are, just leave a comment in the comment section below or copy this code, I guess. From I, I should probably have a GitHub by then where you can get this code. But anyways, then if you if everything is correct and you don't have to worry more, you can just say hide. And this will hide this sprite. So if I run the scene, then we can no longer see the player. So yeah, that is why hide is here. So this is for when the game starts, we'll have like a menu that says start or whatnot. And when we work with other things, we don't really want anything to happen. So let's prepare for collisions while we're at it. Right here where it says extends area 2D, we can just say signal Oops. And we need to say hit. And basically, this is a signal that will be triggered whenever the player is touched. So if we click here on the player node, and we go to the node tabs, here are all the signals that can be emitted. And we added our own custom signal. That's what we just did basically here. We added a custom signal. We created it. It's not actually part of the game, but we created it. So what we want to do is we want to actually, because a lot of these have been coded for us, so we want to use this to call that signal. So we want to go onto the body entered, this one right here. We want to select that one. And when that is hit, it will signal us. So we can just click on connect. We don't have to change any of these settings. We can just keep them the same and just say connect. And here it added that code here for us. This has basically been coded by Go.4, so we don't have to touch any of that back-end code. We can just focus on this. Now, when this happens, we want to hide the player. So hide, because that means something touched the player and the player has lost. We can then emit a signal. And this will basically just signal this right here, that signal we created specifically for this player object. And here we can just say dollar collision shape 2d dot set deferred and here we can just say disabled and true so basically this gets disabled whenever the player is hit so whenever this gets called this will make sure that the player cannot be hit again because remember hide just hides the player the player is still there it's, the player is just hidden so we don't want them to be touched again and then they get another message saying, hey, you have been hit or something like that. So we're going to disable this for now. So how does the game know where to put the player in a new game? Well, I'm going to put this right up here. I'm going to say function and start. And here's the position where the player will start. We can say position. And remember, position is just an inbuilt value by that's given by go dot to give us the position of something so in this case the position of this node this player and you say show to show the player and then we just make the this right here we can just copy that so we want to enable it now we paste it here and we don't need to set deferred anymore we can just say disabled is equal to false So the reason why you didn't just say disabled equal to true underneath here is that it can cause an error because this waits for everything just to quickly pack up before it sets something to, to disabled. This right here will just do it instantly. It won't care what's happening. We'll just do it like that. We have talked about how this can cause errors if you just do things like that without thinking it over. But in this case, it doesn't really matter because we're just, this is when the game starts, this will happen. And this is just going to be the player scene for now, right now. There's not really too much we can do at this moment. Next up, we'll be working on the enemy scene. And yeah, I hope I'll see you all there. If you fell behind, I should have a GitHub link in the description, which you can follow. And yeah, thank you for watching. I'll see you all again in the next video.